thanks for coming, joining us this afternoon on our Just Login uh, Business Continuous uh, Continuity uh, uh, webinar series. So I, I like to kind of introduce everybody to the uh, panelists today. Today's format will be a, diff a little bit different. It will not be just about presentations and uh, pictures anything like that it's more like we're trying to have a, have a have a today we have a benefit of getting so a few different entrepreneurs uh, business owners from different segment of market to share some ideas on how we're going to cope with this uh, COVID-19 situation so I'd uh, just like to introduce uh, Christine Christine is uh, the head of business development from Recruiter Powell uh, Diona, uh, Dionis Chua, who is an entrepreneur, and she has a couple of uh, businesses uh, that she could share uh, with us uh, today. Some insights from her business, especially in the F&B business. And Mr. Charles Wong, who is actually very fortunate for us, he's based out in Hong Kong. Uh, and he's running a fintech company based on Hong Kong. So he might be able to share with us some insights on, you know, uh, the 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 north northern part of uh, uh, of the Asia market, which has kind of gone through this COVID situation first with China, and now they're kind of tapering off. So maybe she, he can share with us some insights from that corridor of the market, the world, right? So I think before I do that, I, I think I'll I'll leave it to open a bit just to give everybody a two minutes, uh, one minute introduction of themselves. Uh, maybe I'll start off with Christine, just to do a quick introduction of herself. Yeah, say hello to everybody. Sure, sure. Hi, Johar. Thanks so much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is an amazing pleasure to be on the webinar with all our friends and our HRMS partner, Just Login, today. Uh, I'm Christine, and I'm the head of our partner acquisitions at Recruiter Pell, uh, as Chohao has uh, introduced earlier. So Recruiter Pell is a recruitment management software that works in seamlessly with your preferred HRMS. Uh, during this critical period of time, uh, we are committed to help employers like yourself and HR teams to make sense of the recruitment landscape. And we are very happy to be able to partner with like-minded partners like Just Login to make this webinar possible. Thank you, Christine. Um, okay, with next, uh, next line, Dionis, um, maybe you can share a few minutes of yourself. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Dionis, happy to be here. So I'm one of the co-founders of Lean Bento. So we are Singapore's island-wide food delivery that serves more than 80 variety of delicious, halal certified a la carte bento and flexible tin cut meal plans. So our kitchen prepares everything daily from scratch, from marinades to sauces and even slicing of salmon from, from a whole fish by hand. So we have often been reviewed as healthy food disguised as tasty meals. So I'm here today to share a little bit of perspective from an F&B uh, owner and as well as how you know, we can all learn together. Thank you, Dionis. Um, next we have uh, Charles Wong from Privé. Hi everyone, my name is Charles Wong and I'm the uh, co-founder and co-CEO of Privé Technologies. We're based in Hong Kong. But we have offices in other parts of Asia, uh, Singapore, Taiwan, and Thailand, as well as in Europe and uh, Germany. So um, uh, glad to be on this uh, podcast today to um, share our experiences. Thank you. Okay, thanks Charles. Um, okay, so, so I think for the benefit of everybody, um, just log in. Uh, it's a HR tech software company with a business for almost uh, 20 years. So I'm the CEO of Just Log In. So during my time over the last two uh, few months, I have been speaking to a couple of clients. So during this kind of COVID uh, pandemic situation, what we found is that some clients are doing better. Some clients are doing definitely worse. And it's not a very consistent thing because depending whether you're essential services, whether or not you are in maybe airline industry, whether you're in travel industry, whether you're in aircraft maintenance industry, some of them have different cycles and somehow this, this situation with the pandemic, it doesn't, it doesn't impact everybody the same way. So, which brings us to one of the, probably one of the first few uh, industries that I mean I like to kind of bring Dionis on this conversation is that FMB is the hit, hardest hit as far as most people can tell 
right? You, uh, you used to be able to sit down in a restaurant and things like that. And people go out to eat. Now everyone's kind of locked at home too. Uh, how, how does, I mean, uh, Dionis, how, I mean, you, you must have seen this firsthand on the front line with all these changes and regulations just implemented. How, how is your business coping in this? Okay, so I, I share a little bit about our business. So a little bit background. When we first started, we were a full retail um, uh, type of business where we had a shop and people really came in, sit down and take away. So uh, most of our businesses were from uh, consumers, customers. Then over time, we evolved. So last year, we went um, fully online. So, and then we became a full delivery and takeaway service. However, uh, and then our business also pivoted, uh, like changed and focused a lot more on businesses. So, although we are not, um, we are also impacted, although a little bit different from how our peers in the F&B industry, where they have actually sit down, where they lose their entire, I think up to 80, 90% of their walking crowds, and that's most of their revenue, we ourselves are also affected because when COVID-19 uh, was first announced, um, people started you know, transitioning to work from home. So when you start to work from home, uh, the businesses that we used to support, you know, the meetings, the luncheons, started to get cancelled. So it was you know, slowly, slowly uh, reducing over time. So the real step that came to us was during the circuit breaker, when everybody you know, just stopped working in the office, so our entire corporate pie and most of our business then uh, was just completely um, demolished, I would say. So, but uh, what we did actually was um, at the beginning of COVID-19, we told ourselves, I think this trend is going to continue. I mean, it's not going to be, a, this is going to be a marathon. It's not going to be a sprint. So we saw that, okay, consumer habits will change. So our, our customer base, our business people are going to work from home. So which means that we are not going to expect meetings anymore. We are not going to expect like, you know, huge groups anymore. So we are going to expect like uh, people eating from home in small, in small groups. So how can we change our business and be nimble enough to support these things? So it's very different. Uh, we, we had to pivot like really drastically because we are very used to, you know, serving 100 meals, 200 meals at a go, 500 meals even. And then now we have to change it to like multiple meals of four packs three packs, four packs, it's very different. So like, we really sat down and we got, we aligned our team to make sure that, you know, everybody knows the importance of this because we want to ensure that, you know, our, our business can still survive until this entire epidemic, uh, you know, pandemic goes away. And then uh, we had to uh, pivot and make sure that the revenue still comes in. So our team really worked very hard to change and to really overcome and, um, uh, to manage this uh, new customer habits. Yeah, so that's what we did. So, I mean, during this kind of situation, did you have to uh, reduce or change your number of headcounts that you have? You know, usually headcount is the biggest cost in most businesses. Correct. Uh, we, as much as possible, as in we, we told ourselves we didn't want to um, reduce our headcount. We wanted to keep all our staff. So that's why it was really, really, we sat down with our team and really aligned everyone to say that, okay, this is our aim. We want to take care of everybody. So let us take care of the business together. And that was how the entire team was aligned and they said, it's okay, there's more work, there's more complexities involved, but let's team up together to get past this. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, given this changes, what are the few concrete steps that you did to, you know, to pivot? What, what, what was it that you went from catering 100 people to 400 people? Was, I mean, especially in this kind of, there has been reskilling, there's a retooling, and, and what, what, what was the concrete things that you, had, you all did? One of the things is like, um, the way you, of course, customer service, uh, like our admin team, for example, when you have to deal with um, like 100, 200 orders you only deal with one person so the admin team there's a certain way you deal with the corporate but when you start dealing with consumers it's also another way where they have to communicate with the consumer it's a, it's a different way of communication so we had to reskill in that way so we talked to our team we say okay when you talk to uh, customers we have to understand uh, more of the emotional needs uh, what kind of uh, uh, difficulties that they might have these are the things that we have to take into consideration and then it's um, uh, we told our admin team that you know 
uh, we have to be more patient when we talk to uh, one on one to uh, these consumers. So that's one one part over there. So of course, then we move over to a little bit about production because when we produce bentos in like a huge batch of like 100, 200, it's like mostly just a couple of varieties, maybe three or four flavors. But when you start producing like three bentos or four bentos in multiple batches, like 100 batches of three bentos of different types, it gets a bit complex. So we had to redesign on how we can sort out the bentos, sort out the orders, so that when the uh, when our uh, drivers come and pick them up, they do not, um, you know, uh, get confused. So these are some of the things that we did uh, in concrete steps. Then in terms of uh, manpower-wise, we uh, there was more work. Definitely, there's more work when you have a lot more orders in small quantities going on. So uh, thank goodness at the beginning, uh, when when people joined our company, we made sure that everybody had the food hygiene cert. Whether is it the admin staff? or you know people not involved in production so it came into handy now so our admin staff um, could double up as um, learn how to help out in production and packing mo mostly the the finished product side because they have the cert they are able to handle the food so this way we are able to better utilize our manpower and of course it, it was very important that we had the alignment of the team first that they really want to do this so we, we sort of sidestep the issue of, oh, this is not my job scope. You know, that, that kind of problems that people tend to face. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a very, it's a very um, good, uh, uh, you know, um, kind of insight of how your business is run. I mean, for us, we didn't just log in likewise to the audience as well. We, when, we dis, when we saw that the market was going to be hit very badly, I think one of the few things that we did was that we focused instead of uh, revenue generation, we focused more on uh, customer retention. Um, so we, we we started running a lot more. Um, we started looking at focusing more on how to make you know, uh, uh, reach out to our existing customers because especially when the markets are better, you know everyone's just chasing for for revenue. But I think when the market's slower, generally the business have to move towards more, you know, being more personal with customers, providing better service. I think at this kind of situation, probably a better service will go further than trying to close the next next bigger deal. So, um, Yonis, would you would you say that uh, um, your 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 business has uh, been able to successfully do the switch? Is is revenue impacted uh, significantly, or is it able to maintain your your yourself? Okay, so uh, revenue is definitely impacted, but we have successfully made the switch, so we are able to keep our staff able to uh, continue our uh, business. So we are very thankful for that. Yeah. Uh, that's very nice to hear. I mean, given that such a situation where, I mean, this is coming from a, where you're in F and B business, you know, when, where the honest business is F and B, you know, it's essential services. Um, I, I think what, how do we, how do we manage all those uh, um, um, business issues? I mean, maybe I'll like hear a bit from Charles' perspective. I mean, you, you, you're running a much bigger setup, a much complex co organization that spans a few countries. Um, maybe you can share with us how your company had dealt with this COVID-19 situation. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joao. So look, um, I think uh, maybe before I go into that, let's just talk a little bit about the contextual um, sort of situation we're in right now, right? So if you look at um, sort of, pandemics as you know things go it's probably you know um about maybe a, about a hundred years ago before uh the last pandemic was uh really, really devastating but when you look at the um economic financial crisis uh in terms of uh, that context uh you also have to go back to um places like 1929 where the great depression um, was basically hitting the U.S. right. So, so um, when what we're doing right now in this current crisis is that we're already in a recession, right? Now the question for us is, um, you know, how do we come out of this um, and not go into a depression? And I think that's really going to be the challenge, right? Because I think most of the CEOs and most of the managers uh, that are running businesses they understand that this thing is going to last 
um, on probably until year end. And as you see countries um, that basically relaxes uh, the lockdown and go into back to business um, sort of uh, environments, uh, you will definitely see in some places the second wave, right? And I think that's really where the question of, you know, is this going to be a stop and go? Um, but then when you're in a stop and go um, economy, um, what you're dealing with is a lot of the, you know, um, uh, things that really require a time to restart. These are the things that are not going to be that easy, right? So for example, you know, why is the oil price in negative territory? Well, it's because you, you just can't shut down the oil wells, right? Once you start up an oil well, they just keep on pumping oil and you just need to find places to store the oil. So right now, um, yesterday, you know, to actually have a barrel, an empty barrel of oil that was worth much more than a barrel of oil with oil in it, right? So that shows you that the, that the, in, that the inherent system, um, once you start it, is very hard to turn off. So another example is the airline industry, right? Most pilots um, would have to go back to training, would have to uh, take a, at least another month or two to go to active flight duty in order to get properly trained. Most of them are being trained in the flight simulators, but um, that's not enough, right? So when, when, you, when you talk about businesses that are going to do well, well, these are businesses that are gonna be tech related, that are gonna be harnessing the fact that they are digitized. And that's a little bit of, what we're doing right now. So our, our company focuses on helping banks and financial institutions um, become much more digitized, right? To be digital and to engage your customers via non-traditional means. So in the past where you would still have bank branches uh, sitting you know, everywhere and that customers go to bank branches and they probably only interact about 10 to 15% of their time on the mobile app, of a bank. Now what you're seeing is because of the lockdown, you know, banks are not interacting with their clients face to face. Now their sort of um, online applications or their apps are being engaged to upwards of, you know, 50, 60%. So the impact has been dramatic, right? So what was going to be a five year trajectory of sort of this digitization wave have now been squeezed into one or two months. And that's really where um, the shock to the economy um, is going to have the most impact because a lot of the businesses that are not going to survive, right? So they're, they're not going to come back, right? So if you have a restaurant and most restaurants I know, you know, would not have a good time trying to keep cash flows alive for more than three months, right? Much less a whole year. So those businesses that are not going to survive, they're not coming back. So that means that the job associated with those businesses, they're actually lost forever. So, so a lot of the misconceptions of, yes, this is going to be a V-shaped recovery. Everyone's going to come back once the government lifts the lockdown. Um, that's probably not going to be true. And that's really what we're dealing with here. Um, and that also then means that if you look at the industries that are going to survive and industries that are going to thrive, right? So these are the Amazons of the world. Um, and um, these industries are still going to hire people. And when you come out of this, um, what I call, you know, recession bordering on depression, all the people that are in the technology field, they're going to be sought after even more. So right now, we're not really seeing a slowdown in terms of tech hiring. Right. So right now, even for our firm, we have people resigning. We have people resigning, going to, um, you know, the, the so-called more up and coming technologies. And I do feel that if the market picks back up again, you will also see these guys um, being sought after even more by the other uh, businesses that are coming back. And and so it's important for us now as an organization to make sure that we put into uh, to place um, a management 
which is um, on top of their employees that make sure that they're even in this crisis that everyone's talking about cost cutting. Um, there's really not a lot of things that we can do in terms of cost cutting, in terms of employee salaries and all that kind of stuff. Most companies that are doing that are really the companies that have been impacted, right? So when you look at the consulting companies like KPMG, they cut all their partner salaries by 50% um, because they, they're, they're just not getting any more businesses. But, but for a business that's still currently operating, but maybe operating at 20% or maybe even 30% less, we don't see an opportunity to cut salaries because um, we know that if we do this today, that once the market pick up again, those guys will probably be seeking um, uh, better opportunities elsewhere and um, holding the salary cut against the company uh, today. So, so what we need to do today is to keep our employees um, afloat of the uh, situation and let them understand what's going on in the company. And, and what we are doing with them is to offer um, let's say um, opportunities where they can buy shares in the company at a cheaper discount, thereby helping us to save some costs. So these are some of the things that we're doing. Uh, now, I I also have to say is that um, you know being a medium-sized company with about a hundred, you know, um, over uh, employees, we did have two cases of our employees that had uh, contracted the virus. So um, so those two. Uh, employees, um, they were based in our European office and um, they were fortunately able to recover um, and uh, able to um, not infect other people because um, by the time that they found out that they had been infected, they were already in a quarantine situation. Fantastic insights, um, Charles. So, I mean, so from what I'm kind of summarized what you're trying to, you, you mentioned a few things is that given this, so you were seeing how an FMB it's like uh, uh, the, the only strategy was to kind of pivot the business, but still maintain. For for your strategy, it's pretty much the same thing in the sense that uh, you worked on it. Maybe you can't, you can't change, pivot your business too much because it's a fintech, but you can probably, in terms of, you change it in terms of compensation, in terms of, of you know, maybe uh, painting a vision because your employees are essentially uh, where you drive value from. So given this kind of um, challenges in, in, in your, your salary have to be kept pretty much uh, still because you want preparing for the next boom. Um, how uh, are you doing anything else with any parts of the other business just to uh, make sure that you, know, you can survive this, this situation? Yeah, I think, look, you know, um, there, there are several things that we're doing, right? So for the senior management, we are asking the senior managers to basically take salary cuts. But for the working level people that are on an everyday, you know, our developers, our business dev people, our project managers, um, those aren't people that we're basically asking to take salary cuts. Uh, but what we're doing is we're offering the uh, cash for equity scheme for them and, and we're giving them um, you know a very hefty discount and letting them know that that our trajectory is to basically write out the storm, right and the and the ability for for us to write out the storm is going to give us more opportunities once the storm is over to then really grow because a lot of our competitors will be not able to survive right uh, so besides doing that, um, we've also um, basically um, uh, took advantage of um, a lot of the government subsidies as well as uh, loans that are made available. Um, so, so we're currently in the process of applying for them. Um, the, the other things is uh, what we're doing is um, we're actually um, um, basically uh, asking ourselves, right, uh, which is, um, if if we do have let's say people that are leaving the company um do we sort of re re replace them right away because uh, right now today we are still getting turnovers so that's still that is still telling us that that the market especially in technology is still quite um red hot that people are still hiring so so we tend to ask ourselves you know 
can we do more with uh, less today? So that means is that if people were to leave and go for better opportunities elsewhere, um, we, we then try to assess whether that role can be partially um, divided up uh, amongst uh, you know, um, one or two people so that um, we can at least not go out to the market and uh, find a replacement right away. So these are all sort of you know, management calls, right? And then um, one of the things which um, I think we've also done is to cut our um, fixed expense. So we used to have two offices here in Hong Kong um, and um, our lease for one of our offices was basically coming due now in, in, in May. So what we've done is we've actually decided to close off uh, one of the offices and uh, switch into a plug and play um, sort of a work, work office space. So that going forward, because um, most of the people are working from home and we have implemented our contingency plan of a, you know, A and B team. Uh, so that kind of saves us quite a bit of cost uh, going forward uh, in, in terms of having to, you know, pay this fixed cost. So now I think, you know, people feel the flexibilities of working from home, uh, but if they want to come to work, they can also do so. Um, having said that, um, I think the listeners must also realize that working from home is, you know, comes with this uh, set of challenges, right? Because um, unlike Singapore, uh, most of the employees um, that work from home in Hong Kong are probably working in a very cramped space, right? With, um, with um, perhaps if you have other family members, right? So they're all going to school online. Um, and uh, so if you have of the family members, especially children at home, it's actually a very, very difficult environment for people to maintain a very professional work from home uh, relationship because of the fact that that when your kids see you know see you at home, um, then they naturally assume that you're not working, right? So, so that's that's really the you know the uh, the thing that uh, our employees need to juggle. And, and we try um, to do daily stand-ups with them. Uh, and we try to sort of communicate on a daily basis so that they, you know, maintain a very professional uh, working relationship when they're working at home. Fantastic. Oh, thank you, Charles. Um, that was a very good insight of, of, of your, your setup there. And um, with this, Almi, I'd like to switch over to Christine. Uh, Christine, you... Um, you are running a recruitment software company, right? Uh, and and you being uh, very close to your candidates and all that. I mean, what what sort of um, what do you think is is? I mean, now the workforce is, is pretty much millennials, right? I mean, what are your peers thinking? I mean, especially in this time, this is probably one of the biggest first time that I faced the, such a huge crisis in, in their lives, right? If for those that weren't working in 2008, but those that just came to workforce in the last 12 years, for example, they'll be the first crisis they've seen. It's probably the biggest crisis they will ever see in their lives. What do you think? It's How, how are they feeling? Uh, especially nowadays, we, are, we, we need to understand this because millennials make up at least 50% of the workforce today. So we kind of want to get your input. How do your candidates or your peers uh, in this space, uh, how, do, how do you feel seeing this, this situation? Yeah, th thanks so much, Chohao. Uh, you know, it's it's a great compliment. I was like secretly laughing because uh, you 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 compared me to my peers as being millennials. Uh, I was actually I graduated uh, within another crisis uh, way back in two thousand and eight. <laughs> so I, I I totally and fully empathize uh, with the recent graduates that are coming out of schools. You know, you would have a lot of hopes when you uh, come out in the workforce and say, okay. I'm going to get my real first job and then you're like oh my you know <laughs> for, for factors beyond uh, your own control uh, you find that the world has largely shut down we have uh, more than 4 billion people uh, that are under lockdown including many of us who uh, you know as of yesterday have just realized that we got a plus 4 to our circuit breaker period 
So I, I really, uh, you know, empathize, right, with the millennials that are, you know, coming out to the workforce and wondering what's next for them. Uh, on our uh, recruitment platform, we do see uh, a very big dip across uh, a lot of the industries that our employers uh, operate in, whereby they are just uh, putting a freeze uh, on hiring. Uh, for, of course, like uh, to, to reckon back to what Charles was talking about, there are certain uh, industries that are still hiring and we are very grateful for that because, you know, that actually opens up a lot of opportunities uh, for some of these um, young graduates that are coming into the workforce. Uh, so at, at this point in time, I think we also, you know, want to address uh, beyond the millennials, a lot of the people who are existingly within, uh, you know, within the workforce population, they are also very concerned because one of the things that is on their minds, and I'm so glad to hear from employers like Dionis and also from Charles that uh, they, they, they have fully recognized that uh, what you do today in a pandemic or in a crisis will be, will be evaluated upon on whether you know, uh, your workforce will stick with you uh, when the recovery stage is uh, kicking in and you need to ramp up your workforce. You know, if uh, you, you could recall, you know, for the attendees that are with us, uh, when uh, McDonald's first uh, announced that they're going to close all the stores, uh, other than the shock that a lot of our Singaporean foodies had, one of the first things that people were asking is whether the staff would be continually paid uh, by McDonald's. So that's uh, something that's definitely weighing on a lot of people's minds. Uh, even if uh, you are currently working in an organization uh, that is not uh, considered as the essentials of the essentials, uh, some of us uh, will definitely have this uh, question weighing our minds whether, you know, post pandemic, do we still have a job? Is uh, what we are doing still being valued by the company? So, so you know, um, it doesn't help that uh, the, we are thrown very dramatically into a work from home, you know, from split teams to, you know, let's try working from home to it is now compulsory to work from home unless you are uh, not able to do so. So that change is quite drastic. Uh, I think in terms of addressing that uh, sort of uh, uh, mental uh, switch, uh, employers actually do play a very big part. Uh, we speak to a lot of our employers to just, you know, uh, get in touch with them and to, you know, render support uh, as a platform, as a service uh, to our employers. And a lot of them, uh, we are very happy to say and share that they have stepped up. Right? They stepped up and they want to address the concerns that their employees may be too scared to even ask. Right? Things like whether, you know, what we're going to do uh, now that a huge chunk of our business is impacted, uh, we're not able to operate a brick and mortar store, so, you know, we are just uh, uh, staying at home. Uh, of course, uh, in Singapore, uh, we do get a very big and generous support, unprecedented, from, uh, you know, the government in terms of job support scheme. And the other uh, kind of grants that are also coming out to help companies to grapple with digitalizing, uh, you know, and helping them to uh, confront this new uh, way of working. So, so we find that, uh, you know, employers that tend to navigate better, you know, like what Chu Hao mentioned at the start, uh, some of the employers that manage to uh, grapple better are the ones that, you know, understood that, you know, the workforce mentality is the key. Uh, to helping them to navigate successfully out of this crisis. So, so you know, we, we are also very, you know, happy to share that uh, a lot of the employers, the, one of the first things they think about, right, uh, is having a town hall, uh, be it a digital version, or even via an email and then call, follow up with a call to actually address uh, some of these concerns. I think that's one of the first things that people can do uh, to, to, you know, um, draw back to what Dionis have also shared. Uh, I'm, I'm very sure, you know, one of the first things that uh, she has uh, mentioned in her strategy to uh, pivot from, you know, consumer into B2B and back to consumer, but takeaways. Uh, one of the things is actually to make sure that her staff is aligned. Uh, because if you're not able to get that kind of alignment, uh, it's very hard to drive the company forward. You feel like you're dragging a dead weight 
uh, across and that can be quite painful. So, so that's uh, something that uh, we, we also recognize. Mm. So would you, um, would you say that this uh, working from home arrangement um, for your graduates, is that a positive thing for them? Do they, would, would, are they concerned that there's no place to go, for no office to go? Is, is it a plus? Should em employers look into making this more like a permanent thing or not? I mean, what, is, what are your thoughts? Yes. Yes. Okay. So data first, right? So we are a platform, so we love data. Uh, one of the interesting data that we have seen is that uh, for those employers that are still uh, positing new uh, job opportunities, there are a increase in the number of contract hires. So the employment type itself has a slight shift. Uh, we know traditionally, even before the pandemic, uh, a lot of the developed countries already exhibited uh, such uh, changes that means uh, there is a increasing preference for contract hires so you know the the considered the good old days whereby you will stuck yourself uh, you know carve a career for the next 10 or 20 years uh, that's not something that uh, is expected by both sides anymore it used to be you know like people are looking at millennial uh, employees and say what's wrong with you uh, why don't you want to grow with us but now uh, it's actually kind of both ways uh, uh, employees are actually seeing it as a very fluid strategy uh, by making contract highs. Then again, you know, it begs the question, if you are entering into the workforce for the first time, uh, job security might not have been uh, on your high on your agenda. And uh, hopefully they are still not high on your agenda for at this point in time, because uh, a lot of the work positions are on a wait and see. Uh, for the employers themselves, it might be good if you uh, look upon uh, these opportunities as a stepping stone. So for millennials, uh, one of the advice that I would uh, definitely you know, recommend is to really uh, look into what the job can offer you, uh, not in the immediate short term, but in terms of whether it offers you a growth opportunity, allowing you to you know, pick up some experience that will help you in the longer run of what you want to do. So uh, work, from, work from home, it affects everyone, you know, like, uh, like you can see, you know, we, we, we had did a, a fun thing. Uh, the virtual background here is uh, to reminiscence uh, about our office environment. So the cartoon characters that you see behind, are, you know, uh, actually a, a, a representation of some of our, our actual colleagues. So we feel like we're still together in a physical environment. But, uh, you know, mental wellness is something that is really often understated uh, when everybody is thrown into a work from home. Uh, like what Charles has mentioned, it's not just uh, children, uh, there could be also pets, there could be you know, a lot of distraction within the house that we have to grapple with. So, so one of the things that we always uh, recommend, if, even if you are taking an interview right, from a work from home environment, um, try to find a quiet spot. It can be difficult, especially in an environment like Hong Kong, where the uh, domestic spaces could be really tiny. Uh, so so it, it can be a little bit challenging. So uh, in terms of uh, job interviews, right, uh, a lot of the millennials are actually, uh, even when they are entering the workforce, we don't see that kind of uh, applications uh, that we typically see year on year at the start. Uh, typically when, you know, uh, fresh graduate pools enter the market. Uh, why is that so is uh, precisely as what Chu Hao has mentioned, right? What, what happens if I get a job and I have no one to report to? I don't see my colleagues. I don't even have an office to go to now. So I think that's uh, really holding back some of um, the job switches. Uh, for the millennials, unfortunately, there isn't really an option. If uh, we have heard accounts uh, which are quite harrowing, that means that you might have started your job search earlier uh, prior to your graduation and then only to have that offer rescinded. Yeah, so, you know, uh, these things do happen, uh, but what we really wanted to, to encourage is that uh, it's, it's like a storm, right? So things, things will pass and uh, it is it's just important, like, uh, like what we experienced in 2008 when we had the financial crisis. Um, these things will pass, right? And you will get a job. So, um, and if you do have uh, challenges, uh, that is where, you know, you, there are a lot of avenues, especially if you're in Singapore, there are a lot of avenues for you to, to go to.
yeah, then they will be happy to share if uh, there are any one of uh, our attendees that are looking for such advice. Hmm. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Christine. Um, I think what I'll do is, I mean, we have about 20 minutes, so I'm going to split it out in the next five minutes. Just a bit more roundtable discussion here for everybody, all right? I mean, now, um, looking forward to post-COVID-19, uh, okay? Imagine, in, in maybe, hopefully, you get out of this situation maybe in six months' time. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just open up to the floor, Charles, Dionis, or Christine. I mean, uh, first of all, I mean, maybe, Charles, what do you think this, what will survive this, what will stay, and what kind of opportunities will there be? I mean, I'll just maybe just two, three, one, well, one minute thing. Maybe, Charles, he can start yeah. first. So, so look, I... I think the good thing that comes out of this is that uh, more and more companies, um, it really doesn't matter what industry you're in, but uh, if you implement the work from home, um, you've got to experiment uh, in the last few months and, and you got to see exactly how your firm can be operated um, in terms of every facet of your firm from home, right? And so that kind of gives you a way forward once you come out of this um, crisis to ask yourself, you know, do I still need an office or could I, could I operate most of my key functions from, from, from home and give our employees that option, right? And, and I think, um, you know, if you, if you look at banks, if you look at um, some of the traditional businesses that have not uh, worked from home, right? So if you work as a trader at a bank, it is almost unexpected that you you could actually do trading working from home, but um, most banks that um, are now basically working from home, they're still doing all the key functions that are keeping that bank um, sort of servicing their customers. So that's really what I feel is going to be a very interesting opportunity, meaning that um, I think companies are going to realize that maybe they need to shift and adjust the work week perhaps, right? So a lot of the talk about not just work from home, but maybe even switch to a four day work week. So these are all things that uh, companies um, will probably be looking at to see how they could really accommodate uh, their employees uh, in a better way going forward. Because let's just be honest, right? Um, you know, if, if you are working from home now and, um, you know, you are saving the cost of really going to work. You're also saving the uh, time of transportation. And there's other, you know, um, um, you know, exterior costs that, that, that you are saving because you work at home. So the fact is now that if the crisis is over, you're going back to work, um, you know, does that make you have a different view on that, right? So these are sure. some of the things that I see. Okay, good. How about Dionis? How about you in FMB? What do you think, how would this change the industry? after this COVID crisis and what, what do you think would stay? So, uh, something very direct and straightforward is that um, the takeaways, deliveries will stay. I mean, like, it's like everybody scrambled to get their takeaway and delivery function up, right, at this stage. So, it doesn't have to be something very complex like, whoa, e-commerce system or whatever. It can be a simple thing like, hey, order this, WhatsApp this to me in this certain format. Boom. They book their own, um, like, riders and then they get the food delivered i think that's going to stay and it those like truly innovative companies that who really understands all this that will also survive this to see the the end at the light of the tunnel in six months time so uh i think this is i mean it, it is a very painful process to change all of us know that so it's, it's worth it if all these fmbs actually put in the effort to do so so incidentally, there's a very interesting question, a similar on, on, on your end. I mean, did, given this online ordering, do you think that uh, do you need to beef up your IT system when you did that? Mm, okay, so I mean, my personal view is that you, if you're at the beginning stages of getting from traditional to online, don't invest too much money in a huge IT system because things are going to change. Because you don't know, like your business, it could be like, super good in certain things you will only know it after you start like for example perhaps you, you are a company selling uh, pizzas and wraps and um, I don't know so then you realize that oh people love the pizzas more than the wraps but you customize the entire system to be for wraps then it you are just wasting money so I would say go simple go low cost 
go go for maximize your your profitability so that you can have enough to get a real proper system where you have the data. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Christine. How about yourself? Um, on, on, on your take of what's going to happen after this in terms of recruitment, in terms of, I don't know, in your industry, what's going to change? What are going to stay? Okay. I, I think it's a, it's a shake up. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, industries, if I'll say, you know, all the industries are impacted, although in varying degrees. Uh, so in terms of uh, technology, you know, digitization has always been, you know, the topic of town for a lot of HR professionals, but it's likely to accelerate when people look at contactless uh, workflows, how can we get things to be really seamless from system to system. So I think uh, that's, that's going to increase uh, kind of uh, what uh, Charles was talking about. Uh, technology tools are actually some of the main beneficiaries uh, from this. Uh, that being said, when it comes to recruitment platform, although our data suggests that you know there is a slight depression in terms of uh, the number of job opportunities at this point in time, uh, as with uh, you know the recovery, whether it is slow, is a U shape or V shape. Uh, Ten tendency is that talents will always, uh, you know, be be in re uh, re requisition. It will be always important, uh, and I think that it will serve employers who are a little bit more, uh, you know, very uh, well prepared for the recovery to start kickstart that process of branding yourself. Uh, you know, in terms of employer branding, what you stand for and how you have uh, brought your team across this crisis and survived. I think that is a very interesting story to tell and also attracts, you know, the like-minded tends to attract the like-minded. Uh, I, I saw that there was, uh, you know, questions about identifying good talents. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, we get asked that kind of question. So, so uh, what we always like to say is that uh, like, like our love for data, only, uh, you know, when you get the person on board, you will be able to understand, uh, you know, some of the attributes that the person brings to the table. Uh, of course, you can do your testings, you can read the very awesome resume that the person has prepared for you, uh, but it doesn't belie the fact that we are largely operating in a uh, scaled economy. So we're not talking about people who can, you know, just turn up and then, you know, do the job. Anyone can do the job. We're looking for really people who are dedicated, who are able to understand what the company stands for. And also when the tough gets going, you know, especially in such a situation, uh, are able to, you know, understand and navigate and align themselves with the company. So that, that sort of a relationship, uh, as we read, all relationships require some sort of, um, uh, you know, cultivation. So it might not be uh, as, as clear or as employees would have hoped, you know, through an assessment or just by looking at a person across a Zoom call, you'd be like, hey, that, that person is a keeper. <laughs> so I think that's something to, to grapple with. Uh, but one of the good things that we have always seen uh, is that choice employers tend to invest or double down on their existing uh, workforce and try to foster the culture because it's, it's in the toughest time that you need the people to deliver their best. And if you do that, then you have a much higher chance of coming out on tops because there are, it's, it's a relative thing. Uh, as a business strategy, you know that some of your competitors are not going to survive. Uh, you want to be in the other half of things, you know, uh, being the, the competitor that survived. So you want to make sure that your people are, are well taken care of. And uh, if they have any concerns, if their morale is low, that you actually address it up front, uh, even before they take it to you. Mm. Yeah. And so, so, okay. uh, so I think, Chu Hao, so look, I, I, I see a lot of questions from the audience, right? Yep. Uh, I think one of the things that is clearly not a um, sort of a question, which is, you know, um, are the people that are on the lower scale of the income, are, are they going to be more impacted or less impacted? And I think overall, generally, the data is telling me that they're going to be the most impacted, right? So, so what does that mean? That, that actually means that you're going to have a big segment of your society who had this, um, you know, in the, in the gig economy, these were people that didn't have a permanent job, right? So now in this economy, uh, they're probably gonna be the most impacted. But that sort of 
resonates throughout the whole economy. I think Singapore probably uh, would 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 actually fare a lot better than the other economies simply because your government is a lot more active, proactive in terms of helping um, its own citizens and and helping uh, uh, businesses uh, survive, right? And uh, but I think if you go to other economies, um, there is probably less cash available for them. So the big impact I see globally is going to be really the people at the bottom end of the scale, bottom end of the income scale. And and the question is, even if this thing, you know, dramatically improves, um, I don't think that you will find that the jobs will be there or available for them. And I think that's really the reality that um, that that I see uh, because some of these businesses are not coming back, right? Now, um, what does it also mean for all, all this work from home, right? I think, you know, one of the news that, that you saw in the market, why um, sort of SoftBank pulled back from the uh, WeWork uh, share buyback was because they knew that the entire real estate commercial industry was going to be devastated, right? So, so even if you come out of this, you know, with your, you know, fingers intact, you also see, you know, because of the work from home situation that a lot of the commercial rental space, those are probably not going to be, you know, re recovering to where they were before this, right? And most companies will now say, well, wait a minute. Do I need that big of a space? Can I do with less? You know, if I believe that my employees are going to give me um, the the same amount of production, if not more, but they're actually happier, right? Because you know they don't have to commute, uh, and they could actually um, uh, plan their time much better as well, right? So, so Dionis, I mean, you you in you have you entrepreneur as well, business. Do you do you, do you agree that that with Charles on the the fact that the, because there was question on real estate, you know. So mm -hmm. I just thought you know, open up the floor, everybody. What do you think, mm -hmm. real estate? Will will it be a more? Will it be impacted somehow? Do you do you need more space, less space after the crisis? Mm, okay, so maybe I talk about like F and B itself. So before COVID nineteen, we. Uh, f and retail particularly before COVID-19 started people have been there's already less footfall going on because we have evolved as a as a species where we got lazier and we want to stay at home and do our shopping so less people actually across the board restaurants have been um, uh, commenting that hey their footfall is dropping and their delivery apps are actually you know uh, as in there's a lot more orders on the delivery apps so the COVID-19 just um, totally accelerated this whole thing and brought everybody online. So uh, I think after when, when things taper down a bit, um, probably there will be less uh, need for the outlet space because people are, um, uh, how do I say, um, because consumer habits will have changed in a more permanent manner. So All right. I, I tend to agree as well. I think this uh, this situation with the whole COVID uh, situation, everyone will sort of think twice, right? I mean, Charles brought a work from home situation and everyone is looking harder at their business. Because one thing about the, uh, the hardest expense to get rid of other than employees is actually the rent. So if you think about it, this COVID situation, and yeah, you look at the rent cost is actually one of the biggest costs. And if you're able to get rid of 50% of it, it's it's a it's a pretty an awesome number to save, so I I think yeah people will start looking harder at real estate expenses or contracts and, and maybe more more we work kind of arrangement more gig arrangement. Okay, so for for the benefit of time, I just want to answer a few more live questions. Um, so we have a gentleman. I mean, I believe the panelists can see those questions as well. Um, I think. Uh, Gordon mentioned that uh, Gordon Sanders see a hiring slowdown in a hiring timeline due to interviews happening online. Um, how do you ensure compatibility, team compatibility? I mean, anyone wants to take this answer? 
Yes, maybe maybe I could uh, also uh, take this question from Gordon. Uh, thanks so much for this question. I, I think a, a large part, uh, you know, drawing back again to the previous question, I know it's, it's sound, it may sound unrelated because it's talking about real estate, footfall, but if you think about it, uh, when consumer behaviours have changed, do you think that employers' mindset will have changed? I mean, we always say that uh, necessity is the mother of all you know, innovation. Uh, I guess a lot of times what was really holding a lot of Singapore employers back when it comes to uh, remote hiring, contract, uh, employment was that it was messy, right? You have to deal with uh, things like how do the teams gel together? How do you piece out work and then send it across, uh, you know, people that you may have never seen, right? But with work from home, nobody see each other. <laughs> I mean, you could have do Zoom calls, but uh, this is a very uh, a large scale work from home experiment whereby your teams are actually segregated. So one of the, the things that, uh, you know, uh, as job seekers or even uh, for for employers to think about is post COVID-19 or post pandemic, will the way people look at remote hiring, uh, you know, and how they deploy, uh, you know, workers, will, will it change? And I think uh, that's, that's something, if it, if it does, you know, uh, goes down the one way street, like, you know, the way look, people look at how they get their food, you know, uh, is going to be a takeaway thing. Uh, it's going to be a lot more convenient. If uh, employees are able to make things work during this period of time and they say that, hey, I could hire the best talents uh, around the world uh, to do work for me. I figured how to make sure that people are able to work together even if they are not physically in the same place. Uh, what would that entail for your workforce? What would that mean for you who is competing now not in a single locale but in a larger uh, global workforce that is now your uh, competitors right so to speak and how do you stand out uh, when it comes to what Gordon is talking about team compatibility you do need to you know uh, have very clear uh, goals about what you wanted to achieve as a team and uh, that could be very much uh, you know taken as an opportunity. You could see uh, COVID-19 as a very good way to test it out because if you can make things work when people are not in a same uh, physical environment, then the likelihood that you're able to make it happen uh, when you know things recover and you do have an office to report to, that 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 uh, is going to be a walk in the park. Okay. I mean, look, what I would say, right, Chu yeah. Hao, I mean, and uh, Christine is that from, from my side is, you know, where in the past, probably the communication uh, aspect of the management um, is a very important aspect of, you know, hiring these managers. But I think now you sort of have to ask yourself, right, do I have the right managers to manage these people as they work from home? Because I think that, that it, it does require a different type of manager. Uh, most of the um, things that I have sort of witnessed is that if you're not a very communicative manager and you're trying to manage people working from home, it's even more harder, right? So it's like, it, it sort of changes also the way that, you know, you want to hire your managers. Fantastic, guys. Um, thank you, everybody, for, 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 for contributing. So I'm sorry that well, time is kind of cutting short a little bit. So I just kind of want to sum up what what i think what we've heard today so in general what we find is that there will be a change is is i think everyone on the panel kind of agree that it's going to be a huge change and one of the few key things that the recurring theme that keep coming up is the fact that communication seems to be key at this kind of time especially when dealing with employees especially with managing employees and communicating employees to keep them in your company retain them as much as possible and grow them and make them more flexible so you i think it's a um, it's 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 a definitely uh, communication is definitely a key thing here and also the next thing the theme that seems to appear is the fact that this this COVID-19 will change how work is done it's going to be more gig economy more flexibility on how jobs can be done can it be on site can it be off site can it work from home I think most companies have to agree that you know you this is an opportunity to rethink your business uh, how to make it more flexible dealing with different kind different styles of working uh, employees now so it gives it, it opens up the doors to more uh, more ways which a business can adapt to this kind of crisis if you can survive the COVID-19 you probably can survive any crisis that comes out in the future 
This is all a good time to look at uh, technology upgrade to use this opportunity to uh, uh, look at you know how to optimize your employees and the technology that you use. A lot of people don't really look at these things when times are good, so this is a great time for you to look at. And last thing that that seems to come up is we look at the data. You have to go back, you know, data. Look at you know, look at hard look at all your existing customer data. How we've done business in the past. How we've done business data is going to be an important key in how you survive this this crisis. So, um, so for the sake, I think I'll probably uh, share everybody some deck that we have. Um, we're talking about next webinar. So we're gonna have a next webinar coming up. Uh, the Chinese version of webinar. Uh, I'll be one of the speakers, as well as uh, someone from uh, another company, Awakenings. So they will be sharing about um, similar things, but especially the context more will be in Chinese. All right. So um, we will be sending up a feedback form when you close the sessions. You can close the. Uh, you can fill up the feedback form and give us some feedback on what you think about this webinar and what like, topics we should share in the future. And um, yeah, so if that's the case, I'd like to thank all the panelists for this today's webinar and discussion. I hope everybody got a little uh, something out of it. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.